The ACC's fight to survive has put it in a legal battle with the Florida Attorney General. Plus, we're looking into the strange case of a popular NFL aggregator account and how popularity could change the WNBA. It's Monday, June 3rd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Something strange is happening with one of the more popular NFL social media accounts. Joining me now to discuss is FOS reporter AJ Perez. Welcome, AJ. Hey, thanks for having me back on. Yeah, great to have you. So Dove Kleinman has an NFL-focused X account with nearly 290,000 followers, consists largely of aggregated news and highlights, occasional infographic. But recently, you noticed that something was off with this account. What made you start digging? Actually, a few weeks ago, one of the uh, the other people, I keep in touch with a lot of the aggregators and a lot of people who follow these accounts more than I kind of, more closely than I do. And they noticed some kind of, since the Super Bowl, uh, the last few months that some of the graphics have changed, the some of the verbiage that everybody's gotten used to because a Dove's account goes back many years. And, you know, he's gotten a lot of community notes but during that time, well, since the community notes started getting going about a year or so ago. So now there's a correction. And, and why that matters is because last July, um, back when it was still Twitter, I think, uh, uh-huh. uh, now it's X, launched, uh, you know, a system to pay creators. Uh, so if you, if you're, if you subscribe to, um, back then it was Twitter blue, it was uh, now it's like it's X premium, uh, you know, you get, and you have a certain amount of followers and you can make money off of Twitter. And there's some estimates that he was making now two to $4,000 per week during the NFL season. Cause his, you know, if you, if you get the right engagement in the, on the, on, on the other side is, you know, to get that engagement, sometimes you have to go outside the box of something you would not do here at FOS ethically. Um, and, uh, and that, that does drive that, that does drive a lot of engagement and that's how, uh, that's how these accounts make money. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so things started shifting sometime post Super Bowl, Um, and, and yeah, some stories started to come out, maybe a little bit difficult to corroborate that he had maybe sold his account is do, do how solid is that reporting? Yeah, Barstool had a story a few days ago on it and kind of saying that he was sold in December. No dollar amount, no anything. But I mean, that kind of piqued my interest. And I started calling around, texting, DMing some of my people. And uh, yeah, there, and I, uh, Jack Settlement, who is in this kind of, uh, he's in the uh, sports media space. Um, And he he told me uh, that that, uh, Dove reached out to him in December, won $75,000, and then came down. And then when he's like, I don't think so, it's kind of like, you know, one of the, there's a couple of reasons. One that Dove lives in Israel, so international transfer could be difficult. Getting that money to him and back, you know, in a you know a, a safe way. And the other part is it is against X's term of service. You can't sell accounts. This happens, but this happens all the time. Really, it's an open secret. There are, there are even marketplaces on the internet where you can you know sell an Instagram account, sell a TikTok account, or sell uh, an account from X. Um, and so it's kind of this is fairly done fairly often. But, you, you know, the, so I reached out to to uh, to Dove and he emailed me back and he's like, I can't said he's like, I can't talk about that Twitter account. That's basically what he said. And so it didn't he didn't say that it's still mine. I didn't say I sold it. But uh, we I did some more digging uh, beyond what Jack told me and a couple other sources. And then I found this this Bitcoin transfer about eight days after the Super Bowl this uh, this past February for about twenty one thousand dollars in Bitcoin. Uh, was exchanged to, and this and that Bitcoin accounts linked to the profile for the NFL Dove Climate account. Yeah, wow. Um, and yeah, that that no comment quote from Dove. It it's the detail that stuck out most to me in your story on this, which you should all read on on frontofficesports dot com. But he said, respectfully, I can't comment on that Twitter account, which you know I'm. Maybe it's still his. Maybe he's still running it. I who knows. I don't. But that's not generally how one would describe their own social media account. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I've spoken. I've I've uh, interviewed him before via Zoom. So uh, I know how uh, how how it goes. Uh, kind of he can be kind of cryptic. So I was not shocked by that. So it's really we don't really really know with any hundred percent certainty that it has been sold. Even though the graphics have changed and the uh, 
the, the, the language has changed in, in, in these posts. And he got community notes before this, week, those, those corrections and the account now is recently has gotten about well, within the past month, at least four. So and mm-hmm. that demonetizes those posts. So there, so that, so uh, someone who's verified on Twitter can't make money off those. I mean, that kind of speaks to the world he's in, the business he's in, or whoever's running his account of aggregating. And because basically what it seems like is, you know, he's got alerts for yeah, Adam Schefter. Yeah, you know, yeah, th- that's what they do. So like not only the big guys, they have, they have all the beat writers and every single team has two or three beat writers. All these aggregators, whether it's ML, JPA, NFL rumors, they all have tons and tons of notifications for all these different people around the NFL. You know, it could be, uh, you know, even a backup beat writer somewhere covering a team. Just probably hundreds of notifications set for these. And that's how they get this information is what they get in trouble with is, one, not citing us correctly as journalists. And number two is taking what, what's been reported by legit journalists and blowing it out of way out of proportion or just mischaracterizing it. So if that's how they get engagement, though. I mean, they, you know, or just making stuff up totally, which has happened a few times. I'm not, you know, some of these accounts have been caught doing that. Now, the most recent example and why I kind of like went on Twitter uh, a few days ago, uh, sorry, on X, was the Mark Davis where, you know, Dove Kleiman's account tweeted that he's uh, his, you know, Mark Davis and his girlfriend are expecting a baby. Now, this girl <laughs> within not too long later, within a couple hours, that alleged girlfriend said they're not dating. There's one picture from the soup from from a 2022 Raiders game where she was where she sat next to. Mark Davis, that's the only connection, and uh, even drop the name of, you know, the, the father's name in this uh, this post on, on X, just blowing this whole thing up. And that, you know, this is before a community note, community note could even go on to that post because he, whoever is running, who's, could be, whoever's running this account deleted it, so. Yeah, right. And, um, and just to make that clear for our audience this is mark davis the what 70 something year old uh owner <laughs> of the las vegas raiders and yeah. you know a 20 something you know circus late answer um yes so um and i mean that's the thing with aggregating is you have to be fast you have to be faster than all the aggregators so mm-hmm. yeah some you know atlanta falcons beat writer put something out and then dove and all the other accounts with much bigger following say you know blow, blow it up and they're not fact checking and no. um, I also just feel like the aggregators have have gotten a lot bigger on Twitter in the last couple of months. I don't know if that's just my own perception or that the algorithm no, is targeting me in like, this way. People in the NFL actually kind of like amplify them. Current former players are amplifying these accounts. They're maybe they're not the most sophisticated news media hounds or like, you know, devourer of news. But you you're you're giving you're taking away a report that someone else did that they're aggregating, not giving that, that reporter outlet, you know, the proper credit and they're getting the engagement and these journalists who are working for newspapers and other outlets are not. Um, and that's uh, so, but that, but they've made a, you know, they, they're making money off it now for the last, this is since last July, you're able to make money off these things. And uh, they're, you know, that's what the $75,000 figure that, that, that we have in the story that the account likely went for, you know, there's some estimates I've been talking to people that's, that's how much he could have made pretty much during the, if you, if you count the training camp to the, to the Super Bowl, you know, Dove could have made about that much. So it, but he did express to me in November that, you know, this is exhausting, basically what he told me. And I have other, I have some other you know, texts from other people where he said the similar things. I want to get out of this. And, you know, cause it, he's in Israel. He doesn't seem like he sleeps. Uh, he, he has, you know, many, many ex posts per day. Um, because that's how you have to make money. Not every post is going to hit. And, uh, that's, you know, he put, put out a lot of, a lot of posts over, you know, the last six, seven years at least. Yeah. Yeah. Very strange stuff and sort of a disturbingly large part of, of sports media and media generally these days. AJ Perez, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. The WNBA is getting more viewers than ever before, and with that attention comes more awareness of the league's physical style, and that awareness could eventually change how the game itself is played. Caitlin Clark is the big draw, but the trend is not exclusive to her. ABC, ESPN, ESPN2, CBS, ION, and NBA TV have already had their most watched WNBA games ever this year. Five of those six have involved Clark and the Indiana Fever, but CBS broke its record with an average of 704,000 viewers with a game between the New York Liberty and Minnesota Lynx. 
On Saturday, the Fever pulled out their second win of the season, beating the Chicago Sky 71-70, to but the result got less attention than a play in the third quarter when Chicago's Kennedy Carter knocked down Clark while she was awaiting an inbound pass. Clearly an intentional foul that had no purpose in terms of the game action, like preventing a shot or stopping the clock. Fever coach Christy Side said after the game that the team has already been sending plays to the WNBA where they feel like Clark has been, quote, hammered, and that they would probably add the Carter foul to that list. The comparison I've seen in a few places is that today's WNBA is similar to the NBA of the 80s and 90s in terms of physicality. The NBA changed its rules in officiating to promote offense and allow its best shooters and passers to shine. With record audiences tuning in to watch Caitlin Clark cook, the guess here is that the WNBA will eventually do the same. A Division III college baseball team has now outlasted its own school. Birmingham Southern, a college of around 1,300 students, decided in March to shut down after struggling to find funding. Their final school year is over as of Friday. But on Saturday, Birmingham Southern hit a walk-off homer in the bottom of the ninth to survive an elimination game against Randolph-Macon. With no school to back them up, the team has raised $110,000 through a GoFundMe campaign. They didn't manage to pull off another upset on Sunday, losing to third-seeded Wisconsin Whitewater, but their season ends with the unique achievement of having outlasted their own school. And soon, Olympic athletes will get their moment to shine, and one of them did so already in an unexpected way. Gable Stevenson, who won gold as a wrestler in 2020 and is a two-time NCAA wrestling national champion, has been signed by the Buffalo Bills as a defensive tackle. College football is obviously the primary pipeline, but between spring football, rugby, and now wrestling, teams have shown their willingness to get unconventional in their search for talent. The ACC is battling the Florida Attorney General with support from the other Power Four conferences and ESPN. Meanwhile, the Pac-12's claims it is not dead. Uh, joining me now to discuss is front office sports reporter Amanda Christovich. Welcome, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Good. So yeah, I feel like every time we talk, it's like everything's crazy and there are lawsuits. Um, so let's start <laughs> with the ACC lawsuit. Uh, the Florida AG, Ashley Moody, is claiming that the ACC violated the state's public records law by refusing to produce documents related to its media rights deal. Turns out that all the big conferences and ESPN care a lot about these deals not becoming public. So what's this all about? What's at stake here? Yeah, it's it's funny because this lawsuit is one of five that is related to the fate of the ACC overall, right? There are um, sort of two lawsuits each related to whether FSU and Clemson can leave the conference without having to pay, you know, really exorbitant, uh, in their words, exit fees, um, you know, just trying to figure out if these contracts that the ACC has are enforceable under the law. Um, the lawsuit that you just talked about is part of that battle, right? Because um, the Florida AG, in her attempt to support FSU, is trying to get those contracts to become public. Um, you know, arguing that the fate of hundreds of millions of dollars in funding for a public university in the state, um, you know, are at stake based on what these contracts actually say. And so she's claiming that um, they're subject to public records laws. The ACC obviously doesn't think so. They're saying they're not subject. You know, they're not headquartered in Florida, even though they operate in Florida. Um, they are not subject to those laws, you know, in their opinion. That's one thing. And then the other thing is, is even if they are, um, they're arguing that these media contracts are, you know, consist of trade secrets, which is something that ESPN has agreed to or has agreed. Um, and, you know, they go around, they have like lawyers who go around and file, um, you know, supplementary briefs, basically saying, hey, like, do not publicize our documents uh, and our contracts, file them under seal. Our terms uh, consist of trade secrets and it would be very detrimental to us if you publicize them. And also, wink, wink, hint, hint, we would no longer want to do business in your state. So that's kind of what ESPN said in their response, what the ACC said in their response. And then as you mentioned, Big Ten, SEC, and Big 12 also um, agreed to not like formally join the lawsuit, but they also filed a brief in support of the ACC's position because they don't want a new precedent being set for their media agreements to be publicized. Yeah, and I, I'm trying to figure out like what they're they're trying to cling to. I mean, it seems to make enough sense that if they, you know, it's better for them to be private than public, you know, just as a matter of doing business. Is it just that, or is there some sense that there's something in this agreement that could be detrimental either to 
you know, FSU's attempts to leave the ACC or something else that could be embarrassing? Is any hints around that? Yeah, I mean, the idea of this lawsuit is that, like, these agreements might be saying, you know, the ACC says the agreements, um, you know, hold FSU to these really high exit fees, but maybe they don't actually. And if we could get our hands on the agreement, then, you know, we could see for ourselves. The issue with that argument is that the ACC, you know, does keep their agreement, their media agreement under lock and key. It's only available if you go to the conference office, like physically, right? Like they keep those documents very private, but they are available for the conference or the schools in the conference to view. Um, And part of the redacted media agreement was served to the Florida State um, Attorney General, according to the ACC, when they filed their countersuit against um, FSU in December. Like that was part of the documents that they served, right? So their argument is like, we have our protocols for keeping these documents private, but that doesn't mean that no one can see them besides us. I see. Yeah. And for FSU's attempts to leave the ACC, it feels like the the media deal... Yeah, I mean, certainly it's it's part of that equation, but is it going to matter in turn? I mean, is the exit fee going to be part of the media deal or or how how do, is there a direct relation here? Yeah, so there's a contract called the Grant of Rights, which is one of the contracts in dispute here, um, which is basically the school sign away the rights to their games to the conference. So the conference can sell their media rights package. They all do it. Um, but part of a Grant of Rights binds the schools together um, for a certain number of years for the duration of the media contract. So the grant of rights in the ACC theoretically goes until 2036 when their media agreement ends with the SPN, right? So FSU says, we don't want to wait to leave before 2036, right? Mm -hmm. There's an exit fee, like it's like around $140 million um, at this point based on a formula that they've all agreed to. And, but then in addition to that, the contra- the, the, the grant of rights, you know, according to the ACC, says that if the school does leave, they have to pay all this money, but then we get to keep the rights to their school events. They ah. can't take it with them to the next conference. That's what a grant of rights does, right? So the value of those media rights is also something that FSU is claiming it could you know, lose as part of a penalty. I see. So it's not just, I mean, 140 million is a lot of money, obviously, uh, right. even for a, a very well-heeled school. Um, but it's not just, we pay that and then we're totally free and can, you know, make as much money somewhere else. The ACC might still be able to cling to, you know, F- FSU's, um, you know, it, it's it's media rights somehow. Um, exactly. Interesting. This is sort of feeling like the Pac-12 a few years ago, at least from an outsider's <laughs> perspective of big schools want to leave uh, because the media rights deal is not satisfactory and it might take them a little bit. But th- 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 are you feeling death spirally here or is this is this a different situation? I mean, I think it's um, a different situation because there is a media agreement that's binding these schools together like through a contract. Mm-hmm. The Pac-12, Whereas the Pac-12, the, theirs was expiring. Right, right, exactly. Their grant of rights was expiring in 2024, so now. So basically, since they couldn't re-sign a new contract, all the schools were able to leave without any penalty whatsoever, right? Because mm-hmm. the contract was over. So this isn't quite the same thing. But, I mean, look, if a court... They're four lawsuits about the question of, you know, in various jurisdictions about the question of the value or the the enforceability of these contracts. So I can't speak to like when there's going to be a ruling, which one's even going to stand or have a precedent or whatever, or how long it's going to go. Um, but there is a chance that the ACC breaks up if these contracts are ruled unenforceable. However, it's a lot harder and longer of a process than the situation of the Pac-12. Yeah, interesting. Uh, and speaking of the Pac-12, uh, you've got a, a feature this weekend um, saying that the the Pac-12 claims it is it is still the Pac-12 and it is still a conference and it's 
still going to be doing conference things. Uh, that runs counter to the popular narrative of the Pac-12 is no more. So, you know, what are they getting at here? Yeah, I mean, you know, technically the Pac-12 uh, continues to exist. Um, so obviously, as we all know, starting in uh, the summer or later the summer, it will only have two schools, Oregon State and Washington State. They're going to continue as a conference just with two members. They are have like a very reduced staff. Pac-12 Networks is being sunset, but they're sort of like transitioning um, the resources that they're retaining from Pac-12 Network into um, a broadcast arm called Pac-12 Enterprises, which is not going to be a channel on its own, but it's going to produce like the home football games that are going to be shown on the CW and Fox, or, or no, the ones on the CW, which is like they signed like sort of a small media deal with the CW, right, for like football games. Um, and it's going to produce some other sports as well. Um, they're also going to try to use it to as another revenue stream to try to contract it out to like if another college or pro sport wants their events produced, Pac-12 Enterprises will do it for you for a small fee, you know, things like that. Um, and, you know, our fabulous features editor, Peter Richmond, uh, described them to me when we were editing the story as scrappy. And I think that's like the perfect way to say it. Like, literally, it's going to go from like close to 200 employees to 30 across yeah. this network arm and the conference, right? There's a new commissioner. Um, there are, you know, a lot of employees who are staying. Um, well, not a lot, but, you know, like it's mostly Enough. made up of previous, it's mostly made up of previous Pac-12 employees, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it, that's what they're going to do. You know, they have the scheduling partnerships for football with the Mountain West, for other sports with the West Coast Conference. So they have opponents, um, and they're just going to like ride this wave for at least a year, if not two, um, until 2026. Yeah. And I imagine there's some amount of infrastructure that was you know, built for a, a 12 school conference, um, that, you know, can maybe punch above its weight when it's, when it's just dealing with two schools and, you know, games against the mountain West. Um, all right. Yeah. Interesting, I guess. And they've got the name, you know, the PAC 12 name, I think still matters yeah, for now. They're, con they're, they're continuing to call themselves the PAC 12, even though their new nickname is the PAC two, they've got over a hundred million dollars of a war chest from the settlement with departing members. Um, and their other assets. It's weird. They're like kind of in a, they're, they're in a much better position than I think anyone expected them to be. That's just yeah. my opinion. But um, based on the reporting I've done, it's really remarkable, like what they've been able to structure and accomplish for this upcoming year. Yeah, cool. Well, good for them. <laughs> Amanda Christmas, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for having me. That's it for today. The NBA and NHL finals are coming, as are the Olympics and a whole lot of baseball. Subscribe to get the stories behind the headlines every weekday. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.